a true mismatch. So you want a mismatch. And there's also extreme mismatch too, where you get a very narrow neck. And I'll show you in the pictures coming out. Another study here is Lagola. This is randomized control study, high level of evidence. Three years follow up, not too bad. Okay. Again, mismatch and been restored on a bone level and, and matching on a soft tissue level. They found significant difference between the tissue level, which matching platform, versus no significant change in the crystal bone on the mismatch on a three years follow-up. And that just been published in 2019. Okay. So this is an example about you know kind of extreme mismatch. You get a great result, but you got to be worried about this big crown and the crucial load. And this is, the, I know this implant, I've been trained on this implant in Frankfurt. This is a conical connection implant, but you don't get a screw loosening on those. You get implant fractures and a button fracture. So when you have more uh, mismatch, you worry about embutment fractures and implant fractures. Um, when you have narrow, mismatch, and you're not going to get really the benefit of the mismatch or the platform switching. So this, I'm sure you guys are aware of this implant, this is ankylose. So another study here is uh, by Ken again, 2010. He measured the thickness of soft tissue in the aesthetic zone. That's very important, right? You know, I, I have tons of patients, they want to restore the anterior implant, they want to place implant in the anterior. They cannot go about without a tooth in the front, but they are okay with having one tooth missing. And the aesthetic demand much more higher than the aesthetic zone, right? But also, you know, well, if we are lucky, we have around one millimeters plus minus. That's not a lot of tissue in the aesthetic zone. So does that mean that we need to do some type of tissue conversion? Do we need to do some type of procedure to thicken in the tissue? Do we need to do? Yes, thank you. And also, I, I, what I like about this study is that we have objective tools, which is called periodontal probe. We have it in every dental office that we can place it on the gingiva. And we can, if we can see through, we know we have some type of tissue, um, thin, thin uh, tissue type. So that's a great, because every office has this type of instrument. And if you're, please come on in. Can we get that chair? Oh, here we go. So we're talking about how is um, dental office, we have a great tools in the practice called Periodontal Pro. Who's the hygienist here? Great, we have three hygienists. Oh, this is great tools you have in your practice. Good. Can you live without periodontal probe? No. Great, great. I'm, I'm so proud of you guys being here because I think dental hygiene is playing an important role in the health of the dental abutment. Okay. So we have also clinical trials, just gonna repeat itself the same information. Um, so with both keratinized and attached gingiva, non-attached gingiva, Currentized, non currentized Unfortunately, the, all this study, we don't have any evidence that it's important for us around dental implant. But logically, we don't like that, right? We don't like tissue that's moving, mucosa that's moving. We don't like it if non currentized We know we see more plaque on those patients with non currentized tissue, right? But we, the evidence is not there, at least in the old study. Thanks God, we have some new evidence. It's correlate bone loss by saying like, okay, we have more plaque, we have more inflammation. It must cause some bone loss for us. So we talk about that we want to do in the aesthetic zone, in my opinion, some type of tissue conversion. We want to get better result. It's one shot. You're going to place that implant in the aesthetic zone. If it's failed, you're not starting again from zero, you're starting minus 100. So this is one of the great tools. I, you know, I'm gonna share with you some of the protocol I use or some of the procedure I use in my practice. 
this is lens person which I'll show, this is socket seal surgery. You know, we're going to take full thickness from the palate and we're going to close um, the socket. We're going to place the implant or you can place the implant, place your membrane, place your pornograph material, your bone chips, and then you're going to do the socket seal. And I love this concept because remember what we talked about? We have a wound, we have opening inside the body. And what we want, the tissue and the mucosa, the skin want to close the body as soon as possible. We're trying to tell the, the body, hey, don't worry, we already closed the body. We have a socket seal surgery. We have a tissue closed. Please just integrate and we'll get a good result. The body doesn't know, doesn't care if there's implant or not, right? So it's gonna heal. So I think this is a great procedure. You will get more clinicalized tissue you will have a better healing, and many times you will preserve the bone. And you can get four millimeter thickness of this type of, because you have a double thickness. Now the problem with this protocol, that we gonna, we want this tissue to integrate, and the tissue height for the change around two to three millimeters. So the blood supply is gonna come from the side, but that's very limited. So we get some failures on those procedures. <coughs> So another publication, another protocols, and this is the same concept. With the part that's double thickness, okay, epithelium connected tissue, we're gonna seal the socket, okay? And we have also extra inlay part, and that's pure connective tissue, that we can get it as an interpositional, you can split thickness if you're comfortable doing split thickness, and tunnel that, toward the facial, now you're getting a socket seal, you're gonna close the body, you're gonna tell the body, it's great, you are good, don't worry, and you're gonna get more thickness toward the facial, right? That's desirable effect that we want to have. So more tissue on the facials, better, you know, better result, less grayish area, I hope less dehiscence. We don't know anything about the buccal plate. I, don't, I couldn't find anything that would tell me if I do extraction and immediate placement, if that the bundle bone is gonna stay or it's gonna go. We don't have any evidence that that bundle bone we can save or not. So thicker tissue is a great idea. So I started using this protocol. This is one of my patients. And what I use, the, in, the inlay part, the interpositional part, I use it for the facial and the lingual, so I'm getting more stability, and also I'm getting more blood supplies, right? So there's a great benefit from doing these procedures on your patient for socket seal procedures, okay, after immediate extraction of the tube. So this is, um, this is the desired effect on, on the left-hand side, those, that column. And this is the different procedure that we can do. And I'll show you some other procedures, it's connective tissue. And also I took it further, I did a connective tissue that I vascularized, that I pedicle from the palate and move it and rotate it to the facial. Then I did the same procedure that I harvest connective tissue, keep it connected, keep it vascularized, rotate it, pedicle it, and tunnel it around the implant. And I'll show you some clinical cases. But also I like the combination graph. So I, um, I, I created this novel approach where I utilize combination graph that's vascularized and rotated in doubles. And I just published this articles in Wiley uh, clinical case report just, just last month. I have these articles in your package for your review. What's nice about this, art, uh, this article is it's been photographed step by step. So it's very easy to understand how we did the procedure step by step. I want to move on to the position of dental implant. Because also as a restorative and also as a surgeon, we want to understand where we're going to place the implant. Are we going to place the implant bone level, tissue level? Subcrystal. We have now a lot of dental implants that we place them subcrystally. And actually the drills longer than the implant itself, one millimeters. So it's designed to go subcrystal. So what the deal here, what the story? 
I think this is a nice study. A lot of dentists follow this, and dental company choose uh, that's manufactured dental implant by Herman. So with a rough, smooth line, he concluded it needs to be bondable. Makes sense. Rough, you want interaction with the bone pass and this posterior integration. Soft, gingival levels. I know the hygienists love soft tissue, um, uh, polish colors and polish abutment, right? Much easier to clean. Um, and the whole business, you know, I'm sure you guys are familiar with this famous type of implant. You can see the rough surface, then one millimeter is polish colors, higher. Okay. So the the reason for why we have that one millimeter is higher than, than the bone because we have that connection and we don't want um, any kind of pumping effect from the connection and micro leakage from that pumping effect. So we're trying to put the gaps, the micro gaps of between abutment and implant away from the bone so we can preserve the bone. Does that make sense? Okay, so a whole companies did that. But I have a problem. Um, when I start to do immediate implant placement, extraction and immediate implant placement, which I'm a big fan of, and there is a reason why. Um, but I'm going to focus on, on this concept. What are we going to place the implant three-dimensionally? And I know you guys know facially you want to have enough thickness of bone, you want to have enough thickness toward the lingual, interproximal, you don't want to be close to the other teeth. But I'm talking vertically, because that, I think, the missing part is, I think is we struggle to understand. But when I want to place implant in immediate uh, tooth extraction situation, the, the bone is kind of scalloped. The facial bone and interproximal bone are different height, correct? Am I wrong here? No, it's the bones are scalloped, right? It's follow the gum. So interproximally, the bone is higher. So if I place my implant um, bone level and immediate placement, I'm going to go with the facial, right? The facial bone. So I'm subcrystally automatically on the interproximal. Right? I'm doing the math correct? Yes. So that was trouble. So this is one of my patients. And here's, I placed the implant and I placed the final abutment in the same day. Her name is Maria, she's a great patient. And that's the picture, if you see the date, it's, I think, June 2016. And now I want to bring you this control, a randomized control trial, high level evidence by Alina has been published just now, 2019. It's just been published. And they did this clinical trials, and they compared two groups, subcrystalline half a millimeters and one millimeter and a half. And they couldn't find any difference. So if you place implant, your implant half a millimeter subcrystalline, or if you place it two millimeters, there's no difference, okay? At, for the crystal bone level. So this is my patient here, Maria, and I did one abutment one time, immediate placement. I'll share the complete case with you guys in the end of the um, today. But you can see the follow up. You can see the bone. It's it's on it's this is the bone on abutment level. Okay? This is 2017, 2018. We just seen her in, in, in 2018. Nice result on the bone, right? Is this good? I hope you guys like it. You know, because I was worried doing this in 2016. I, I'm not sure how much evidence I have. I have to if I'm placing it um, bone level facially. Automatically, it's going to be subcrystal on the interproximals, right? And dental course don't dental implantology course don't tell you this. I have to go all the way to Frankfurt to learn about this concept and get a master of science. <coughs> So that's why, I, you know, this is part of my passion and my struggle doing uh, courses because everything is like a cookbook. Do this, get this implant, do that. But always I struggle because I want to understand why. Why this implant is superior? Why are we getting best, better result because we pay more for this implant? Or they have something going on right for them. Okay. So, conical connection. 
I was excited about conical connection because if I get like a cold welding between the abutment and the implant, I felt like I'm not gonna have this problem with the micro gap and, and the toxin release from the micro gap. But actually, that turned out not true. Even on conical connection, we have a problem with endotoxin. And that they published in 2010. If you don't believe that, another study by Canulos, 2015 too. 40 uh, patient, different kind of uh, connection. Um, none could prevent it micro leakage. So we do have a problem with the micro gap. So going back to that case, if I place my abutment and seal it, see that micro, micro gap, and, and conical connection, very stable one, is that better? So this is butt joint type of connection. All these famous implants, so if you utilize those in your office, you see those in your office. I'm not gonna make a lot of comment, but I want you to see the difference. This is done in University of Frankfurt, some type of radio videography. And, and I don't wanna be here. That's a big gap. You see that if I can see it with my eyes, there is no problem for the bacteria to kind of pump in and out. I'm going to have bone loss here for sure. So if you're utilizing this type of um, implant, your patient is going to get bone loss and tissue problem for free. Yes? You're not going to charge them for that. So we have to have understanding. And we don't know. Some of the good company, they have this, type, this connection. So is this as warriors as a dental team working with the patient? We got that privilege of serving our patient. And now, nowadays our patient not, not so trustful. They don't give you second chance. Do they? I don't give a second chance. Sometimes I do. But if we can get it from the first time for the sake of our patient and for our sake, it's a good idea. So again, different kind of connection. If you utilize this implant, I want you, if you utilize one implant or two or three, you should understand your implant well. So this is again, if, if it, we didn't get it right. And now we have some dehiscence and you know, the gray showing. Can we do connected tissue grab, vascularized tunnel combination grab, all these nice procedures. One of them I publish. Is that going to work? Anything more than two millimeter would fail. So if we have a tiny bit of grayish, it's work. If, if it's more than two millimeters, we know from literature different studies, 2008 and 2000. So old, 2010, and then it's been reinformed again, 2008. And those are good study. So we're not going to get a better result by doing tissue. It's too late now. What are you going to tell your patient? Remove the implant or start again? What are we going to tell them? It's very hard. And it's not always about fault. We know what we know and what we don't know, we don't know. So let me introduce the soft tissue concept. And I published about this last year. This is was my master thesis. And I worked over three years on this um, article. And I remember in 2014, there was a, a meeting for the guru in the Academy of Osteointegration. And they came up with the three challenges for us as a restorative insurgents and dental team and patient. Vertical bone augmentation, very challenging. Also, we have a problem with papilla between implant, two implant, papilla, where is the papilla? Black triangle, common complaint. And also the gap, soft tissue gap between the transmucosal and the tissue. So my goal was, and I tried to, 
my mentors speak German and you know they have a different culture in Germany. And I was, you know, I, the good things it was in, in English, the Master of Science, but I speak with them and I tell them this, and then we speak with each other and say, no, no, you cannot write about this. Um, but in the end, they accepted this, and what I told them to convince them, I want to have a surface of my abutment that I can have a good seal between the tissue, the gum, and the titanium or the zirconium abutment or the material of your choice. So bacteria does not invade and cause peri-implantitis. Because peri-implantitis, that was the third challenge that the guru put out for us in the Academy of Sion Integration around 2014. That was a problem. And unfortunately, I, I just, two years ago, I read an article that it says, now general dentists doing more work with dental implant, that's why we have a problem with more peri-implantitis. I think that's very biased. And that's not good, talking about other dentists. Right? Is that the problem? I think the problem, we just have a rougher surface now. Faster integration, but come with a price. Also, we place in more implant because for me, I see a lot of implant done by specialists. Yeah. It's not who's placing it; it's how you place it. Did you understand what what we did? Why we did it? Did the patient was well informed? Did you talk with your patient about the risk? Was your team supportive to you when failures happen? Because sometimes it's just biology corresponded, we don't we don't know why. And the more you know, you know it. We don't know it. The more you know, you, you understand how much you don't know. So I started with uh, my research. I started with 200 titles, 200 articles, and I also searched manually and I found another six articles. And then um, my I this is, was my preliminary pool of 206 article. After applying the inclusion and uh, inclusion exclusion criteria, reading all this abstract for 200, 206 articles, you know, I don't know how is my wife kind of took that, and she was great and supportive, but that took a lot of time to read those abstract. And she's studying too. Um, so anyway, it was very hard, but 16 articles that I kept. I utilize as a final, final, and I extracted the data from those. And I'm gonna share with you guys some of the findings. Well, first, um, I work with my mentors about um, if we want to achieve soft tissue seals, we want to prevent pre-implantitis, we want to get aesthetic result. Let's see what's how is the tissue around natural tooth, and let's try to see if we can get to nature luck. So we study the tissue, I study the tissue around the natural tooth, and the difference between the tissue around natural tooth and the tissue around transmucosal part of the dental implant. And what we found, and there's a lot of study about this, and what's important things I found, we have less cells around the dental implant, we have gap between the epitheliums and the connective tissue and the transmucosal abutment. We have um, less vascularity, if I didn't talk about this. We have less fibroblasts. We have collagen fibers that's more parallel to the transmucosal. Versus in, in the tooth, we have like Sharpie fibers, is inserted perpendiculars, right? And functionals is, is resist chewing, resist forces. So we try to create the same things, and, or we, we not try to create, we search for factors that we can get the same result of soft tissue around dental implant. And this is a measurement, again, it's not about the implant, it's, you know, the measurement of the tissue is the same around different type of implant. This is, this is the slide because what we're missing around the dental implant, the peri-ligaments um, space, and we don't, we don't get any blood supplies from that space, it's, it's, there's just bone. So, and that's how it's looked like around natural tooth. So one of the things I utilize, and I'm 
excited about and I was disbelieving I'd become a believer, utilize NPR app. Or if you use any, or your surgeon, or uh, you use any generation of type of platelet-rich um, growth factor, PRP, PRF, PRGF, all, all those are good for soft tissue healing. Okay? But w what we know too, that um, all platelet derivative growth factors can improve the vascularity. So that's why I'm interested in this. Besides soft tissue healing, we can get PGF growth factors from PRF or PRP and whatever you, whatever kind of generation you use. Also, you can get hypoxia inducing factor and vascular endothelial growth factor. So those growth factors, those messenger, can create more tissue for you, or I'm sorry, more vascularity of the tissue, because the tissue that we have on the crest, on the ridge, usually are scar tissue. Very simple to use, it's very powerful. So this is another study by Berglund, 1991. Lack of vascular supplies in the tissue around dental implant compared to natural teeth. This is the collagen fi fibers here run parallel to the implant abutment complex. So that's not what we want. Same thing. Now, Spach published a lot, and in, in, I think as we all as dentists, we own him a great deal. He published this beautiful result, histological study, but for the first time um, on in this study, we have, he found this histological evidence of collagen fiber inserted perpendicular again the transmucosal part of the dental uh, abutment complex. So that's a great result. If we have a biocompatible titanium oxide surface, we can actually get perpendicular insertion. So that was a great finding. This is how the epithelium uh, in contact with dental abutment hematismosome. And this is the study, the histological evidence, and you can see that collagen fibers run perpendiculars. And that's very mm -hmm. nice. Now, Schwarz also published, and he got different type of surface. He hydrophilic uh, changed the surface chemistry and energy of the abutment. And also, again, he has um, he done histological study, and also that turn out that hydrophilic surface, we can get the same type of result. We can get that uh, perpendicular insertion of the collagen fibers, which is great. That's what we want. We want to have a seal. And if we have that perpendicular insertion, we can seal. Also, he found that there is a gap between the hydrophobic type of abutment and the tissue around the abutment. And this is another histological, this is from Schwarz study. This is another study which Klaus published in 2011. And he used a rat, and he placed a specimen that's hydrophilic surface parallel underneath the skin. And what he found, also hydrophilic nanocrystallized diamond type of specimen. And he found, which is was very interesting here to me, that he found more cells and more blood supply around the hydrophilic specimen. So that's great. So we hydrophilic will give us more blood supplies around um, the titanium. We're going to get more cells, and we get collision info. That sounds like a nat nature like. Mm -hmm. So I was interested in this a lot. So this is, I think you, you all guys heard about this, and I think this is a great. Another study by Navens AL published about, you, you guys heard about BioHorizon and laser lock implant. Now laser lock, um, a platelet surface, been applied to dental abutment. If you work with a surgeon or if you place BioHorizon, you might know about this. But they have this micro uh, channels of eight micron height roughness between the mountain and the valley. And they got a great result too. They have a great seals, and they have perpendicular insertion. Okay? 
Then they apply that first to the implant. They get a great result on the bone and integration. Then even if they apply it in the, um, on the abutment as well. So you can utilize it on the abutment. Eco Hart published another study, but he took it next level. He disconnected the abutment. He placed the abutment again. He did the same study again, the same research, research same histological study. He found if you disconnect and reconnect, you lose that attachment. Is you impaired. But that's what we do. Wait a minute, right? We place a helium abutment, we take the helium abutment, we put impression coping, we throw it out, we put temporary data abutment, we throw it out. Every time, you know, saliva gets in the sand, and I don't know. Um, but that's what we do. So that's not helpful. Same thing for hydrophilic, too. So you put the you know, helium abutment, cover screw first, second stage surgery. This is not efficient. But we have to, sometimes we don't have choice. We have to use all these steps. So this is, again, a surgical study. I think I like this slide because you can see the difference between the pillarol fibers and the functional oriented fiber. And you can see the data micro group. Okay. You can see that laser lock, a bladed surface, that gray surface on the abutment, that rough, that eight micron. But you can see here's the collagen fiber insertion into that um, laser lock type of, or laser ablated micro channel. Actually, I'm very happy that we have that new abutment available commercial, commercially for us to use that we can get some type of insertion functional fibers around dental implants. But, but my concern is, even my good patient with good oral hygiene, life is up and down, and they get some time in a situation where it's family emergency, they get sick, they get something going on in their life, and they ignore their hygiene. So my concern is that that eight micron, that's very rough. I know probably the hygienists will agree with me. Rough surface on dental abutment, hard to control the plaque, hard to clean. So if I have that functional insertion, great. Then if I lost that connection, I'm back to micro gap, that surface of the abutment is not gonna get clean. We violating the threshold of 0 0.3, 0 0.4 micron. When you violate that, you get affinity of microorganism. But it's the same. If you want to get affinity to cells, you're going to get affinity to microorganism. So it's struggle and dilemma. So I'm not sure if I want to use this type of abutment um, on my patient. And if I want to use it, I want to be very careful. But I want to go back to also, what about hydrophilic? If I disconnect, I'm going to lose the same. I'm going to lose the, the connection again. I'm going to tear that insertion. So think about the fibrins and the collagen inserted into the helium abutment, then I'm gonna remove the abutment, I'm gonna tear it. Now I have an opening in the body. Remember what skin wanna do, the epithelium? Wanna epithelialize, wanna create junctional epithelium. So that attachment is gonna go. The connective tissue is gonna shrink down. The epithelium is gonna win that fight. So uh, my conclusion was, this is what I want um, out of my research. I want biocompatible surface that's clean. <coughs> okay. Because dental abutment we get from the manufacturers is non-sterile. And if you sterilize that abutment, it's not good. It's, you're going to change the surface chemistry. Actually, you're going to get inhibition of collagen fibers. Okay, So I want that abutment to be clean, biocompatible, and I don't, I want to prevent any connect, disconnect. So that's lead me to one abutment, one time concept. And that's very hard, hard concept, concept that you need, you need the primary stability. Um, and it's not always applied. Many times we have to do some bone graft and it's not the easy. But when you can, if you can prevent, um, Connect, disconnect, that would be great. 
So this is, I work with a, one of the company in Silicon Valley, um, and we study the abutment surface. And the abutment surface and the implant surface, this is hydrophilic. I'm sorry, hydrophobic. And you can see when it's hydrophobic, it's like, don't want to mix. It's hating the water. You see it, that drop? Now think about that drop of water as a cell. Is the cell want to touch the implant? Want to interact? Want to have an interface with it? No. Now, now we change the surface chemistry and energy. Now this surface is super hydrophilic. Now you can see the difference. And I'm sure you guys um, heard about Stroman SL type of surface, it's called hydrophilic, uh, and you can get um, faster healing. But we don't have anything on the abutment. So how we can utilize the abutment and make it hydrophilic? But you can see the difference. So anyway, these companies, and, and you know, I, I think I call like a 20 company, only one company was company was working, willing to work with me because they work in big indust industry in, in Silicon Valley and, and who are you that does to kind of do something for you? But this company worked with me and they made me like a small machine in my office. I can change the surface of the abutment in the implant to hydrophilic. Isn't that great? And I use it on every patient. I'm trying even, you can see that surface hydrophilic and it didn't come with water. We changed that surface in my office. I didn't have to pay extra $150 to get the difference between Stroman hydrophobic, hydrophobic and hydrophilic. I do it here in my practice. And I can pass that saving for my patient. Do you see how is the blood coming out on the thread of the implant? That's nice, right?